Welcome back to uh, the early afternoon session of Network Biology. We have four 20-minute talks followed by four 10-minute talks, so it should keep you quite awake after lunch. Um, our first speaker is Joris Kado from uh, IBM Switzerland, and uh, the talk is on pathway-induced multiple kernel learning. So as soon as Alex is ready. So, just wait for a minute. Until, okay. Uh, it doesn't work. I'll try resetting the mirroring. Okay. Are you all hearing me well? Okay. That sounds good. Mm -hmm. S okay. Sorry. I got to change. Uh. It's not there. It's not showing up on the displays. We're going back to the PDF. Okay. Do you think that was the issue? Um, okay, yeah, no yeah. That's fine. Uh, everything just kind of, everything just sort of broke. <laughs> Well, no, I tried that first. Now I can't see the PDF for some reason. I'm in Keynote. Look at that. Strange. Okay. No, no, something's happening. Wow, that's a good one. Okay. Um, th that's, is that right? Um, it's showing your notes or something, right? Yeah, there you go. better. Okay. Uh, here we go. Um, Yours, as I was introduced already, I'm a data scientist at IBM Research uh, in Zurich. And I'm very happy to uh, present you PyMKL today. Uh, that started as my math thesis. Uh, so let's jump right into it, uh, because the joke about uh, the, uh, the launch tiredness was already made, so I'm skipping this. Uh, so I'll have a brief introduction, and then I'll go into the details of uh, the method. I uh, will show how it performs and a few other applications of the, the method on other data sets and what you can do with it. So um, let's start with uh, what I mean when I say molecular data. Uh, so biological samples are processed and we end up with this data matrix where the rows are uh, samples or in this presentation mostly different patients. And you have all these features and uh, it's mostly expression data. But so the task is to classify patients according to a specific phenotype. Um, while nowadays single experiments might not cost so much anymore, still to get a large uh, cohort of data might be, cost might be a problem. And also in biology, we always have a lot of noisy data. So that's an issue that leads to some scar scarcity in um, um, availability of high throughput uh, data sets. So to alleviate this uh, problem a bit, uh, we want to exploit also prior knowledge of uh, the interactions of the genes, so say protein-protein interaction networks. And we're, of course, uh, by integrating these two things, not the first and only ones that had this uh, idea. So I'm uh, presenting you two relevant um, methods that also did this. So one uh, by Chen Law uh, used the network topology in the um, uh, loss function as a regularizer. And in another study by Guo, uh, they defined meta features uh, using pathway information. 
uh, in our methodology, we kind of try to include both kinds of information. So that's uh, protein, protein interaction network and these uh, different uh, pathways and gene sets. So we dive into what PyMKL really is, uh, pathway-induced multiple kernel learning, and we start with this schematic. Um, everything clear? Let's go on. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> so I'll walk you through this uh, slowly, and we'll also come back to it. But in the beginning, we have this interaction network that I just talked about, and the molecular measurements. It could also actually be uh, many um, different uh, matrices, and uh, multimodal data integration is possible here. And uh, we have this notion of pathways, so different gene sets that we then, uh, for each single pathway, uh, we do this pathway induction. Uh, what's pathway induction? Uh, so we have here in this visualization to the right a uh, dummy example that will walk you through it. So you have uh, molecular measurements uh, on the left, two dummy uh, examples, samples, and they have features A, B, C, D, E. And say we have this interaction network between these uh, features. Um, we can look at those in this uh, feature space of the different uh, features and the uh, values according to these axes will place the, the sample somewhere in space. So our pathway induction actually now performs a feature space transformation into a different um, uh, dimensionality that's not according to the features, say a gene or, uh, but uh, along the dimensionality of edges. So that's really cool. And uh, this is only uh, possible with this uh, linear transformation to really end up in this feature space that we kind of have this uh, uh, understanding about it. So uh, the way we do this pathway induction uh, actually naturally defines a kernel function that we have here. Are you seeing this? Oh, very good. So we just, just plug in the Laplacian matrix uh, into the uh, dot product. So this will be the linear pathway induction. And uh, we can actually show that this is a valid kernel function uh, but because the Laplacian can be uh, described in terms of the ordered incidence matrix S. Um, and this is ex exactly this linear transformation of the feature space. Uh, so taking a step back, um, this similarity function, it's the only thing you need in kernel learning. So think SVM. And uh, so in, in this kernel learning, you would always kind of, when you then actually train a classifier, you would fit the hyperplane uh, in this space that uh, separates the samples in a, yeah, it's a plane. So in a linear fashion. But um, the cool thing is that you can actually have this feature space transformation and then in this space, there is a linear transformation, but going back to the original uh, measurement space, it would look like it was a, a nonlinear separation. But uh, why it's called the kernel trick is that you don't have to understand what this uh, feature space is exactly. You don't even have to be able to compute it, but uh, you just need to be able to measure the similarity between two samples in this feature space. So uh, you, you can actually stop here when you uh, compute this, but here I'm pointing this out because for us, why we do this is really the point that we know what the feature space is and that we have the understanding that there we have the dimensionality of the interactions between the features and not just the features itself. So and then there's some normalization and stuff going on. Uh, and we come back to this schematic. So one, let's go back. So one thing I didn't talk about right now was the 
the different pathways. So in the example, you have the red and the, the blue example. And um, so looking at these different pathways, you would end up uh, doing this pathway induction, you would end up with two different kernels. So let's say here orange and blue, uh, you compute this, uh, for each pathway, you compute the kernel matrix. And this, at this point, we end up with the multiple kernel learning problem where you have to combine all these kernels into a single one to then uh, uh, train on a phenotype. But um, these weights are actually then included into the uh, optimization problem. And if you do it right, what you actually get back at the end, and this I want to emphasize here because it's really cool, you get back this weight for each kernel. And um, if you have an understanding of what your pathway was that you started with, then you can uh, interpret this in terms of importance that this uh, pathway had in the distinction for this class um, of the binary classification problem. Uh, so, yeah, we see here that using or including the, this weight W into the dual formation. It's not, doesn't look so different from the usual um, formulation. And there's uh, different multiple kernel learning algorithms out there. For example, Shogun was uh, published uh, recently, uh, or open source, let's say better. Uh, but we are using EasyMKL, another one, uh, because it's uh, linear in uh, time, in uh, respect to the number of kernels to have and constant in memory. And uh, we have this C++ implementation of it uh, with the uh, Python bindings, a wrapper around it um, that's also open source. But here, this is a choice. Uh, I want to mention this and it will affect a bit uh, how, how it will optimize for the weight and this will kind of influence how you can interpret them then. But um, yeah. So this was uh, the pi MKL, and now we apply the method in a way that we can compare two different methods. And here, it was really nice to find uh, the study by Kuhn and Fröhlich that uh, looked at actually these six different breast cancer cohorts where the task was to um, classify between the C, uh, um, um, metastasis-free survival, relapse-free survival within five years. So that's quite a hard task actually to do. And you see here also what I mentioned in the beginning that there are not that many uh, patients, not so many samples to work with. But there's also where these uh, kernel methods shine really. So um, they uh, you benchmarked 14 different methods on these different data sets. And here it's kind of an overall summary. Uh, I want to point out that we really followed their uh, regime to, for the, the training and the evaluation, everything. So we can really compare uh, to their results. And if you look into their uh, publication, it's really like their figure and we plug uh, pi MKL on top. So um, we're really happy about these results, but um, we have interpretability in our title, so this, the, the performance of the prediction is not the only thing that we're interested in. But we, of course it's important to show and it's even better, nice. But uh, the cool thing is that you can investigate now these weights that you got back during the uh, training. And you can, we're looking here now at uh, pathways that we used that were always significant higher weighted than the average weight over the different cohorts and we're just uh, we had here 50 pathways actually and we're looking at the ones that were reported as significant at least four times and we see the heme metabolism was actually uh, chosen uh, in every single one and we think this might be uh, associated with uh, vascularization in uh, these uh, tumors. So uh, other 
applications uh, were done on prostate cancer. So here we have, uh, from the same patients, we have uh, the, the tumor and the normal um, tissues sampled, and actually with different uh, data modalities. So there's, the, uh, there's transcriptomic data available and there's proteomic data available, and we run uh, PyMKL on each singly. And there we observe that uh, swath MS uh, proteomics data is performing a bit better. But uh, as I mentioned briefly earlier, the multiple kernel learning framework really makes it super easy to just uh, uh, put more kernels into the mixture that is optimized for. So, and here we see that including these two data types, uh, we really don't lose any um, performance and we don't have to know which data set is the best one to study our problem to in the beginning. And not even this, but still um, it's better to use both than a single data type because you get back these weights for each pathway, for each uh, data modality, and you see that even for the RNA-seq data that was, we saw was not quite as informative before, um, uh, still some of the pathways are chosen and seem to be important for the classification task and the distinction between tumor and normal. Um, this was actually a collaboration with the University's uh, uh, Spital in Zurich and ETH Zurich and uh, these data sets are not yet published but should be this year and there's actually another data set from them where we uh, tried to work on a multi-class uh, task. So here we have the Gleason score for the prostate cancer. And just very briefly, the higher your score, the worse the tumor is more aggressive. So it's uh, uh, also doing quite a well job, not in all classes uh, same. But then we can uh, go back again and look at the weights for that were kind of important in the kernel mixture for each different uh, uh, Gleason score class. And uh, I think it's uh, really nice in this way you can kind of look at the dis degrees, uh, disease progression and just as a tiny thing here that a pop Apoptosis, for example, seems to be more important for the distinction in the more aggressive uh, classes. But yeah, so still the interpretability that you get out of it with these weights depends highly on what your pathways are and uh, what your notion of this pathway is, what, what's your understanding of this. So at this point, I want to point you to the open source library. And it's actually not a typo here. Uh, it's MIMKL uh, MI because it's the framework, the, the general method um, is quite agnostic to the data types. We're just working with the uh, network and the matrix. So it's the matrix induced uh, multiple kernel learning. And uh, what I presented to you today, the pathway induced multiple kernel learning, we actually also deployed it on IBM Cloud as a web service so you can try it out and visualize also the data on the website. Before you start copying these links, I, uh, re you rather copy this link or scan the QR code because this will direct you to a small landing page for the project where you find everything related. So also the publication and uh, a small description and uh, people that are involved to get in contact with us in case you have any questions. Uh, with this, I thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, yeah. Okay. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Yes. Thank you for your talk. Uh, one curse of multiple kernel learning is that almost always in practice, you observe that the pure average of all kernels, so just the sum of all kernels, is empirically as good as the optimized linear combination. Or the, the single best kernel is as good as the optimized. 
combination. So I didn't, except for the one example where you showed the prostate cancer, I didn't see these baselines in your talk. I have read your paper, but I'm not at this point fully convinced that you really need this method and that you do not gain performance by just using kernels in an SVM here. It's a good point. Uh, it's also uh, in our paper we uh, always show this baseline. So you really compare not against the zero weight but uh, the average weight because it's true that the average kernel, that's the hard task to beat. Um, uh, but I want to point out that we're not trying to get the super highest prediction. That's because the, else we could also use uh, the pathway induction and put other kernels on top, like the polynomial or Gaussian pathway uh, induction. But uh, we really want to uh, have the interpretability and this, the, we see that some pathways are actually a bit enriched, so... I see this point to some degree, but okay. of course you have, a, you have an explicit feature map. So interpretability is not such a big issue. Um, you could get weights for, for single edges in your pathways, even without any kind of multiple kernel learning. Not for the entire pathway, I agree on this. But okay. you are dealing with a linear kernel, so interpretability is not such a big, big issue. I mean, uh, I invite you uh, to the booth to discuss this uh, to, into further detail. Also, uh, there's the poster session uh, later tonight. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't think we can uh, go into depth more here. So let's have another question, maybe. I agree. Karsten, catch the speaker after. <laughs> go yeah, ahead, thank you. Uh, I guess it's a bit related. So I was wondering, did you compare with just, uh, because all these pathways are, uh, uh, probably you just, uh, all of them are actually, I suspect, in string. So how about if instead of doing all these multiple kernels, each on a pathway, you just, combine them all and you use string instead of that L in your kernel. How is that comparing? Because string so, contains probably most of the what, edges in this pathway, so, so how what, about using okay. string instead? Uh, so you want to use the... You have that X, kernel. X, L, Y, so that L would be for the pathway, so how about that L was for the whole string instead? Yes, okay. I mean, you could do it, but uh, what you kind of have here uh, is then... Uh, you lose the, this fine-grained uh, uh, thing that you can look at the individual pathways that is being waited for. I mean, yeah, you can do it, definitely. This is just uh, applying pathway induction to, to the full thing. I mean, it's absolutely valid. I mean, uh, that is allowed, the method allows this. But beyond this, we are also doing this multiple kernel learning to get the weights to a kind of... Uh, yeah, I get this weight for the individual pathways that we can think you can interpret them as an importance. But, uh, yeah. And, and the second question, so you, you're talking about the pathway. How many do you use and where do you get them from? Is this the 50 hallmarks from M6DB or exactly. what? Exactly. That's are the ones that you are using? Yeah, I mean, for the benchmarking, yes. And, uh, no, actually also in the prostate. But this is up to you, really which ones you use, what uh, you, you define your own uh, pathways in the terms of how you want to interpret then the pathways. The problem is how uh, reliable they are, I guess. Because I keep hearing yeah, people talking about pathways, but then it turns out most of the time, especially in Casa, they just use these 50 hallmarks from maps in DB. So what's the point? <laughs> Welcome to the field of biology, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not arguing this at all. Uh, we just uh, propose methodology to uh, include whatever pathway information you have, and uh, might be that uh, there are better and worse choices, definitely. I'm very so happy to see such in-depth discussion. You. And thank you. Please approach your yeah. after the uh, during the break, and let's thank the speaker again. And we're going to move to the next talk. Thank you.